Happy Friday, everybody. We've got a very short and to the point homework assignment. As a reminder, um, we are a week away from submission of professional interactions. And for those of you who need to submit your, who have do the extra credit homework assignment, need to submit your uh, documents for that. If you did VITA, you're good. I've already got your names down. By the way, did everybody get my email about checking that to make sure that I had your notes? Uh, I did put a great item. It just says yes or no if you were in VITA. Uh, I did have a few students who were not on the list. So here's the argument, okay? So so everybody know Jackson, the uh, VITA coordinator, okay? Jackson, I, so I don't okay, I don't want to record this, okay? Because this, this will actually show that I have great respect for Jackson, which I do, okay? I'm Actually, if he sees this, if somebody sends him the link to this, I'm going to say that there, there was video editing done to, to make me say that that was the case. Special okay. effects after small ones. Uh, so I, I, yeah, exactly. Special <laughs> effects added to it. Okay. Somebody went in there. Jackson himself probably went in there and edited this. No, I, I, I've got great respect for both the VITA coordinators and they, they work hard. They do good work. Jackson and I are very combative towards one another. It's, it's more of a, it was more of a joking combativeness. Um, so uh, he sent me the list of everybody who was on the VITA. And uh, so I said there were, I actually went back to him twice and I said two people on the list. And Jerry was the first one, okay? And Jerry was on the list. They forgot you. They forgot you, man. What what, what are we going to do about that? Do you feel offended? Do you feel? And, Jerry just showed up on the day of VITA and, and we worked together. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, Jerry's a hard worker. That's all there is to it. But uh, yeah. And then I, then I sent another one to the graduate student. I said, no, the graduate student was on there. And I disagree. I think he went in and modified the list after after I saw it and put that number on there. He was arguing with me. He was going to prove it. He was going to say that it was right. So yeah, that's kind of the relationship that Jackson and I have. And so, uh, and, and then Tori's just, Tori's just without, without a flaw. She just does everything correctly. So yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, again, I'm getting off on a tangent. Let's get some homework done, shall we? Uh, um, yeah, so please make sure you're aware of the stuff coming up on the schedule and get that submitted in a timely manner. All right. So chapter 12, we started out question number 15. By the way, uh, there was an email sent out. Uh, there was a, today's the day of, day of silence, so I didn't pre 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 yeah, pre present, prepare, prepare a list for students uh, to call out. I didn't, they're not calling out names because I didn't want to violate that in case you were observing the day of silence. If you're not, that's fine. If you are, that's fine too. If you just want to be silent because you just want to be silent, that's fine for today. I'm going to do all these myself. I'm going to step up to the game. Um, which of the following procedures most likely to be considered a weakness in any of these internal controls over payroll? Okay. So Oftentimes when we talk about internal controls and you see questions like this, it's looking for something specifically with respect to responsibilities that should be separated, but are not. This is usually a keystone question for a qu questions for questions of this type or keystone topic for questions of this type. So we know segregation of duties, custody authorization reporting. We're looking for a separation along those lines. So let's go through the answers. A voucher for the amount of the payroll is prepared in the general county department based on the payroll department's payroll summary. What do you guys think? Does that sound like a reasonable uh, reasonable procedure? I like that. I think A is just fine. I think A is just fine. Payroll checks are prepared by the payroll department and signed by the treasurer. What do you guys think about that? So that sounds like we've got uh, the recording function taking care of the payroll department. Or actually, technically, without it, I guess it'd be custody function. Custody function prepared by the payroll department. And then the treasurer is the authorization function. So you separate out those two functions. If we didn't have that separation, that would be a problem because the payroll department's preparing the checks and then signing the checks. That's custody and authorization together. So yeah, I, I like that. That's proper separation. The employee who distributes the payroll checks returns unclaimed checks to the payroll department. Oh, now we have a problem. I think I'm getting confused. I'm saying payroll checks prepared, that would be recording. The holding of the payroll checks, the person distributing, that would be custody, okay? So the person who has custody of these payroll checks is now returning these physical checks to the payroll department. So the group that recorded is also the ones who now has custody. That seems like a violation right there. And that's in fact our violation to see. But let's go through D. Personnel department sends employees termination notices to the payroll department. That sounds like just good practice to me. We don't wanna pay people who are not working for the organization anymore. So yeah, we can say C is our answer. All right, 1218. The purpose of segregation of segregating the duties of hiring personnel and distributing pay payroll checks is to separate ones. What? So it's a segregation of duties question again. Hiring personnel, what type of responsibility would that most closely align to? C A R R. I A authorization. Okay. Distributing payroll checks, is that going to be C A R R? We already said so yeah, which is C. Yeah. So distributing payroll checks, that's actually physical custody of an asset. 
So custody would be an answer. So separating out uh, authorization and custody. So that's basically what we're looking at. We're looking for an answer. And C says authorization of transactions from the custody of related assets. So specifically what we identified above, we're looking at C as our answer. All right. I, I realized I said C-A-R-R because I was talking about segregation of duties, not the actual answers in the questions. My apologies. I will say custody authorization recording moving forward because I don't want that to be a confusion. My sincere apologies. Which of the following audit tests would most likely be used to test the occurrence assertion for payroll transactions? Now, just as a note, if I ask a question about existence occurrence on the exam, I will say existence occurrence. I don't like to separate out the assertions. You will not always see that in the book or in other uh, situations. So when you see occurrence, you should think existence occurrence is what we're referring to. It's just being used in context. So which of the uh, which of these uh, tests uh, would uh, most likely be used to test the occurrence assertion of payroll transactions? So trace a sample of timesheets to the payroll register. Um, so is trace being used correctly here? Sure looks like it, because the timesheets are used to develop payroll, so we're moving bottom to top, okay? So if that's the case, what uh, assertion are we dealing with here? Completeness, good. All right, recompute the mathematical accuracy of a sample of payroll checks. What do you guys think about that? Uh, recomp, recompute, what, what assertions I usually deal with? Yeah, yeah, okay. Trace the sample of payroll checks to the approved timesheet summary in the master employee list to verify validity. Is trace being used here correctly? It is not being used correctly, okay? So remember, payroll checks are derived from the timesheets. So we would be starting at the top and moving down. So what should this could be called? Vouching, and what does vouching test? Existence occurrence, okay? So this is our existence occurrence test, and this is one of those examples of tracing being used incorrectly. And the book could probably say, it's okay, because sometimes they use trace as, as existence occurrence, man. It's all good. So why would we teach vouching and tracing then if that's the case? Just annoying. Just annoying. You know, I, I don't want to be annoyed on a Friday because it's a Friday. All right. Uh, moving on. 1223. An auditor is most likely to perform substantive test of details on payroll transactions and balances when what? OK, so let's think about why we would perform substantive test of details. Now, keep in mind that it's most likely that's going to happen. In, it's, it's likely to happen in most circumstances. It's very rare that we don't do some substantive test of details. But in the situation where we would try to avoid substantive test of details, what probably happened? Well, at the very least, we didn't get full controls or uh, controls, uh, or we didn't get full assurance from controls. Again, that's not uncommon. It usually happens. But we know that some substantive testing has to occur. Now, when I say some substantive testing, you'll notice I didn't say substantive test of details. I said some substantive testing has to occur. What are the two categories of substantive testing? Substantive tested details, but what can we do before that? Yeah, substantive analytical procedures, very good. So let's say that we get enough assurance from our analytical procedures test that we say we don't need any more assurance. Can we pass on substantive tested details? Yes, absolutely. So what would be the most likely circumstance in which we need to perform substantive tested details? The answer would be yeah, well, we do not get enough uh, uh, do not get enough assurance from substantive analytical procedures. So that being said, let's look at C. Substantive analytical procedures indicate unusual fluctuation in recurring payroll entries. Does that bring up cause for concern? Are you going to need more assurance in that regard? Yes, you absolutely are. So that would be the part, point we say, all right, we would like to rely on analytical procedures, but we need more assurance. So let's move on to substantive test of details. And that's the way we would think about this. Uh, let's go through the other answers just for context and talk about why those wouldn't be the case. Cutoff test indicates a substantial amount of accrued payroll expense. When do cutoff tests occur? They occur during substantive tested details. So there's no way we could say we need more substance. We need substantive tested details during substantive tested details. Okay. Um, level of control risk relative to payroll transactions is set at low. All right. So control risk being low means likely our risk of material statement is low. Is that going to put more or less emphasis on substantive tested details? Less emphasis, yes, because our control our detection risk is high. Accrued payroll expense expense yeah, accrued payroll expense consists primarily of unpaid commissions. This one's an interesting one. Okay, so do we need more substantive tested details? Can we develop a model that can actually calculate payroll commission or that can cal calculate unpaid commissions relatively effectively? Is our commissions a function of another number in the financial statements? So when does a commission usually occur? When a sale is made, and usually it's a percentage of the sale, correct? So if we know what that percentage is, and we know what the uh, the number of sales is, can we actually develop a, a model for commissions? 
Yes. Okay. So we can rely more on analytical procedures in that area. All right. So if it's primarily unpaid commissions, the answer would be we probably aren't going to perform as many tested details. It's unlikely we will if we get enough assurance from analytical procedures. So this is an interesting question. I think it's a little bit too muddy for the type of question I'd ask on the exam, but I do like the intuition behind this question. I do think that it's an, an interesting question to ask. All right, moving on to the multiple choice questions in chapter 13. Which of the following control activities would be most likely to assist in reducing control risk related to the occurrence of inventory transactions? All right, so again, we're trying to reduce the control risk related to existence occurrence, okay? So keep in mind, if we're talking about control risk, first of all, we're talking specifically about a control. We're talking specifically about something that would be relative, relevant to controls. And we're trying to identify something that would relate to reducing risk, something that would actually minimize risk in this area. So uh, for no reason whatsoever, I'm going to start at D and move up. OK, so subsidiary ledgers are periodically reconciled with inventory control accounts. OK, now, is that a good control procedure? Probably so, but I don't think that relates to existence occurrence, okay? I don't think that relates to existence occurrence. So we could say that's a good control per step. It's probably make sure to make sure that these numbers do reconcile. That's probably not, it's probably VAA, not existence occurrence. Inventory is periodically reviewed for slow moving of obsolete items, which may require a write down. Again, is this something that should be done? Could we do this as part of controls? Sure, okay? But we actually specified this one area. We know what assertion this relates to. What is that? VAA, okay? Summary of the receipt reports is independently compared to the inventory status report. Okay, so we're doing a match here of documentation and we're trying to make sure what's happening with inventory status relative to receiving. Okay, so which happens first? We receive the items or we put them in inventory? Receive the items. So the receipt reports generated first, then inventory status reports generated based on that. Okay, so we're starting at a lower level and moving up or to, to an upper level. What direction is that? Up, okay, so that's tracing. And then we're talking about what type, what assertion? Completeness, okay. Inventory manager does not have the ability to record inventory transactions. This is, this obviously this is the answer because the other three are not correct, but why? What is the risk if the inventory manager had the ability to record transactions? Our inventory manager is probably in charge of the warehouse. So they're, they've got the custody function. If they had the ability to record transactions, they could say, oh, I'm deleting this obsolete inventory that uh, I want to get out of the warehouse. And the obsolete inventory, I don't know what to do with it. I guess it'll go in the back of my trunk or in my trunk in my car, yeah. So that would be an example of something that could actually create problems. And would that create problems in existence currents? Absolutely, because we'd say we believe we have items, but they're no longer they're no longer available. They don't exist anymore because the inventory manager is now selling it on eBay. Does anybody even use eBay anymore? That's like, uh, you know, I, I know that there was a lot of eBay clones anymore. Like the Amazon had their own marketplace up and there's some other places that sell online now. I still think I haven't done eBay in a long time. It's just, I'm, I'm kind of old. All right. Apparently I'm older than most people's parents. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, moving on to 1317. Independent internal verification of inventory, i.e. proper segregation of duties occurs when employees who do what? So again, we're trying to make sure we separate out custody, authorization, and recording. So let's go ahead and go through. Issue raw materials, obtain material requisitions for each issue, and prepare daily totals of materials issued. Is there a segregation of duty violation in this particular issue? What do you guys think? Yes or no? I'm going to go no. That seems like something that whoever's responsible uh, for obtaining the material requisitions, probably somebody in recording is re recording this information, is probably just checking to make sure everything's correct. Okay, So that seems like a good verification step to me. Compare records of good on hand with physical quantities. Okay. Do not, not maintain the records or have custody of inventory. So we're talking about comparing goods on hand with physical quantities. We're probably saying this number is correct. They're verifying information that's in the system. All right. They're not the same people who maintain the records, which is obviously a recording function, or have custody of inventory. That sounds like a separation of segregation of duties to me. I like this answer, but let's do the rest. Obtain receipts, transfer completed work to finished goods, prepare the completed production report. All right, so somebody recording says, all right, it looks like everything's been done. I should probably finish the production report. Seems like a logical step to me, no violation there. Our independent of issuing production orders uh, update records from completing job cost sheets and production cost reports on a timely basis. These all sound like recording steps to me, so I'm not too concerned. The only one I'd be concerned about is B, and that is in fact the answer. All right, 1320. An entity maintains perpetual inventory records in both quantities and dollars. If the level of control risk were set at high, 
an auditor would probably do what? Okay. Um, this one's an interesting question. This one's an interesting question. Let's talk about the intuition here. <laughs> if I set control risk at high, what does that likely mean about risk of material misstatement? Possible. That's possible, yes. But uh, would we set what would we set risk of material misstatement at? Would we set it low, medium, high, in all likelihood? High, because we're probably do, inherent risk is high in most organizations just by virtue of being an organization. Again, this is most uh, that we're talking about a, a, a most of the situation, most scenarios. It's possible that inherent risk could be low. In this case, it doesn't matter. But for the most part, we're going to assign or say control risk at high means inherent risk of material misstatement is high. If risk of material misstatement is high, how much assurance do we need to gain from our test of our substantive procedures? A lot. We need a lot more assurance in our substantive procedures. That's by definition, because we didn't get as much assurance early on. We need more assurance later. So we're looking for an answer that provides us more assurance, that provides us more assurance rather than less assurance. So it says the entity performed physical accounts of inventory several times during the year. All right. This is an interesting question because you would look at this and you say, wow, that's going to be perfect. That's going to be that's got to be the right answer because they're doing this more and over. Is this correct? Obviously, I'm, I'm make, making I'm, I'm kind of bringing this up and I'm, I'm making it sound like it's definitely not correct. And it's not because keep in mind that this doesn't specify what the inventory balance would be at the end of the year. OK, this only tells you what inventory balances are at a point, point in time. And we're concerned about making sure that inventory at balance at the end of the year is correct. So that doesn't help us. Apply gross profit test to ascertain the reasonableness of physical counts. OK, um, that sounds like a good procedure, but that's not necessarily relevant to whether or not we need more assurance. In fact, I would say this is a low assurance test. OK, increase the extent of test to controls the inventory system. All right. Now, let's think about this. Logically speaking. We set control risk at high. What does that mean about test of controls? Have test of controls been completed? Presumably, yes. Presumably, yes, test controls have been completed because we set controls at high. We said controls are not good. All right. So can we increase this test of controls? Can we, can, can we increase the test of something that we've already completed? No, we can't. OK. OK. It's a little bit like saying, OK, uh, my students struggle on the exam, so I'm going to give them more questions on that same exam. You've already completed the exam. OK, that's that that's that past in the past. We're moving forward. Request the entity schedule the physical inventory count at the end of the year. This is an interesting one. Obviously, the correct answer, but why? We talked about this during we during when we talked about controls. We said, when do we want to do certain interim testing and when do we want to avoid interim testing? Does interim testing provide more or less assurance for us as auditors? Less. Interim testing provides less assurance. The reason why is because we have less information and we don't necessarily have as much detail about what's going on at the end of the period. So if we schedule during the interim, it's convenient but it provides less assurance. If we need more assurance, then we would schedule for period end, all right? And that's why we're getting to that point there. That's how we get to that point. All right, 1322. When auditing merchandise inventory in a year end, the auditor performs a purchase cutoff test to obtain evidence that what? All right. Um, so this one's kind of an interesting one, but uh, let's go through the answers. Um, so obviously we're talking about a purchase cutoff test and we wanna make sure that we know What's in the, what should be in the system, what should not be. So we're talking about cutoff, um, cutoff assertion. That being said, it's a little bit, it's a little bit dicey. The, the answer to this is not immediately apparent. It doesn't necessarily imply cutoff is the assertion. So all goods purchased before year end are received before the physical inventory account. Um, does that something that has to happen in an organization? Do, do do we have to receive all goods over? Like, could you could you purchase something and receive it next year? Absolutely. Okay. So A's out. No goods held on consignment for customers are included in the inventory balance. Okay, they're held on consignment for customers, then they uh, probably should be included in the inventory balance. Because again, we're holding something on consignment. This is implying that we have ownership of the goods, so they should be included in the inventory balance. Goods reserved during the physical count are pledged or so sold. Okay, so this would not actually uh, relate to a purchase cutoff test. That would actually be whether or not they have ownership of an item. Okay, so we got D. All goods owned year end are included in the inventory balance. That sure sounds like a, a cutoff test to me. That sure sounds like we're talking about something. Now, it doesn't say before or after year end, but it does specify in one period what is actually uh, what is actually owned by the organization. So D is our best answer. The wording on this question, I don't particularly like this question. I think it should be a little bit more clear, but that, that's that's what we'll, this is what we've got to work with, guys. All right, 1323. Last one. Last multiple Inquiries of warehouse personnel concerning possible obsolete or sloping inventory items provide assurance of management's assertion of what? Okay, this one's a little bit more straightforward because we're talking about obsolete or slow moving inventory. What's the danger of having obsolete 
or slow moving inventory. So basically a company has got all these Blackberries and they're saying, we're going to sell these for a thousand dollars a piece. Their stock is only going to go up. Their stock is going, I watched a little bit of the big short, by the way, the other day. And I was just, I was giddy because it was a two thousand. It was set in 2008 and everybody was typing on their Blackberries and receiving pages. And I was just kind of like, Oh, this is so cool. Well, those were the good old days back 16 years ago. All right. Blackberries, they're obsolete. Okay. If we got this inventory item that is no longer worth what we paid for, what are we required to do? We got to write it down. Okay. Say these blackberries are now worth one cent. We could scrap them and, you know, maybe people can use these as, well, what could you use a blackberry for anymore? A paperweight. Yeah. Like these were the good old days. Yeah. That was better my answer right there. Okay. Okay. So yeah, write it down. But the company doesn't want to. They're just kind of like, you know what? We, we think that we can sell them one day. We're going to keep them on the books. What are they in violation of in that situation? Proper what of inventory? Proper valuation, okay? Their inventory is not, that they're not properly valued what the inventory is actually worth. So valuation is our concern. By the way, when you see absolute slow movement, absolute slow movement inventory, that's generally the inclination that we're going for right there, that we're talking about, that their valuation allocation accuracy concerns. All right. Now we got some questions in chapter 13, because I do enjoy chapter 13. Inventory is great. Inventory is great. So... 1332, in obtaining eventual matter of financial statement assertions, auto develop specific audit procedures to address these assertions. So here's the audit procedures. Well, this is a lot of fun. Okay. So uh, basically what we have to do is we have to go through these and identify which assertions would apply to the specific audit procedures. Okay. And again, this one is great up until we get to E. And then E basically is just kind of off the wall. Okay. So they said completeness and accuracy and valuation and presentation and disclosure. Basically, they just decided to write a whole bunch of assertions there. I think the, the, specif the specification of that particular test is uh, completeness. I get the impression that this was somebody who did not understand assertions and basically said, you know what? I'm not sure which one it is, so I'm going to write down a whole lot of them. So uh, but they, 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 there, there is an argument that they, the basis of valuations could be valuation, accuracy and valuation as well. Um, that being said, I don't like E, but uh, we'll get to that. So ensure that the entity has legal title to inventory. So this is rights and obligations and pretty obvious to rights and obligations. So what would be a good way to do this? This one's a little bit more subtle, but we talked about this previously when we talked about this in purchasing and revenue. Our step would basically be, all right, what would imply ownership? How, what document would actually imply that we have ownership of an item? And this would be something that would be discussed by the board of directors or within the loan agreements. So we would review the loan agreements and the board of directors meetings minutes. Now, is this probably the way that I would go about this if I was testing this as an auditor? Probably not. I probably would look more specific documentation. But given the other answers, this is probably the best one we got. I'm not going to say that I like this answer, but that's the best one we got. Ensure that to record inventory quantities include all products on hand. So we have completeness. Everything got recorded. This one's a little bit more straightforward. So if we're talking about a procedure to test completeness, what is our most common procedure in this area? What do we call that? Against the letter T. That's right. All right. Has anybody ever seen the Museum? Capital T that rhymes with P and that stands for approval. Yeah. I'm really old. All right. So uh so tracing. Which one's an example of a tracing procedure of the ones we listed up here? Uh, one through five, because we already used six. So let's look at number three. Select a sample of items during the physical inventory count and determine if they've included on the count sheets. We're going from floor to sheet, which is a tracing test. So three is our answer. Uh, verify the entry inventory has been reduced when appropriate to replacement cost and net realizable value. Now, we've got two of them that actually are both VAA, so we've got to specify which one is the best VAA test. This one's a little bit straightforward, okay? So how can we confirm whether or not we're at replacement cost or net realizable value? Probably need to know what it's worth right now in this day and age. So how do we do that? We look at the vendors, see what the vendors are currently charging for that. So examine the current vendor price list. This one was easy. The next one I don't like as much, okay? It says, verify the cost of inventory has been properly determined, which is accuracy. The answer the book gives is they said that this was number four, okay? But I think that the answer is number one because I think you do the same exact thing. You would go back to the vendors. And so you answered one, you're fine. If you answered four, you're with the book and consistent. Uh, I think both of them, there's an argument for both of them, but I think this is the more simple and more straightforward one. Oh, verify the major categories of inventory and their base evaluation are adequately reported in the financial statements. Man, there is so much here. I think I said completeness before, but I think actually it's more presentation disclosure. My apologies. 
I, I have actually underlined much more than the others, and uh, but I do not like the way that they specify this. So assuming that this is presentation and disclosure, let's just go ahead and ignore, let's chop the Gordian knot, and let's say this is presentation and disclosure. What does presentation and disclosure relate to? It relates to presentation and disclosure in the financial statements. So what is it we should probably look at? The financial statements, number two, review dash of the financial statements. Someday they'll correct this and they'll do presentation disclosure and we'll all be happy. But right now it's just frustration. That's all there is. And which is sad because I like inventory. All right. Here we go. This is a fun question. Ando Company, I'm going to read off my, my notes because I got these uh, underlined. Ando Company, a diversified manufacturer, has six divisions that operate through the United States and Puerto Rico. Ando has, uh, has typically, sorry, has, dip, has historically historically allowed its divisions to operate autonomously. Ando does not have an internal audit department and corporate intervention occurs only when planned results were not obtained. Hmm. All right, there's a problem. <laughs> Ando has a policy of hiring competent people. Management is fairly conservative in terms of accounting principles and practices, but employee compensation depends in large part on performance. So we talked about this in chapter four, when employee compensation is tied to, or is tied to performance, what do we call that from a fraud perspective? It's not not necessarily opportunity. It's related to related to fraud, but uh, so yeah, or incentive or pressure. Yeah, incentive or pressure is what we're talking about here. So basically, if you're going to get paid, you got to get the results. All right, which is a problem with tying that compensation together. JP Kumar is the general manager of the appliance division that produces a variety of appliances. Kumar has been able to improve profitability division each of the prior five years. How much of the improvement came through cost cutting? including a substantial reduction in flow control activities over inventory. All right, now we're starting to see where things are going here. Recently, new competitors entered the market and offered substantial price discounts in an effort to grab market share. Kumar is concerned about increasing profitability is not maintained. His bonus will be reduced. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right. Kumar, it gets better. Kumar decided the easiest way to make the appliance division beer more profitable was through manipulating inventory, which is the largest asset in the books. Kumar find by, by increasing inventory by 4%, income could be increased by 8%. Now let's just talk about that real quick, okay? So um, this is something that I talk about in some of the classes, but everybody understand why increasing inventory would actually result in an increase in, uh, in income. So what happens when you increase ending inventory? What does that do to income? Well, keep in mind that in most systems that you, when you increase ending inventory, what does that do to cost of goods sold? It reduces cost of goods sold. If we reduce cost of goods sold, that increases gross profit and thus increases our income. Okay. Now there's a mathematical way you can look at it. For those of you who enjoyed 221 with me, remember I had the base equation, BASE equation, where it's like beginning plus additions minus subtractions equals ending. And you can reformat that for different op applications. That's how you can figure that out. But strictly speaking, when you increase ending inventory, that is going to increase your bottom line for that period. It does terrible things to subsequent periods, but the current period increases it, which is why a fraud over inventory is generally not sustainable. All right, so uh, with a weakness in inventory control, he felt it would be easy to overstate inventory. Now, isn't that just cool, okay? He actually scraps uh, internal controls. Like he has, he, he basically cost cuts internal controls over inventory. And that allows him to do further shenanigans to cost cut even more, you know, because the cost cutting, he got his bonus up. And then those cost cutting mean that he can commit fraud easier. That is just working smarter, not harder, guys. That is just working smarter, not harder. Yeah. <laughs> Efficiency right there. All right. Here we go. Employees count the uh, goods using it, count sheets. Kumar was able to add two fictitious sheets during the physical inventory, even though the auditors were present and were observing the inventory. A significant amount of inventory was stored in racks that filled the warehouse. Because of their heightened difficulty in test counting them, Kumar was able to conceal an overstatement of inventory in the upper racks. Oh, boy. After the count was completed, Kumar added four additional count sheets, and that added $950,000, or 8.6%, to the stated inventory. Kumar notified the auditors of the emission of the sheets and convinced them that they represented overlooked legitimate inventory. So, yeah, that was out there, guys. We just didn't have the count sheets. You trust me, right? I mean, look at how strong my inventory controls are. Yeah. Uh, the auditors traced the inventory to items, the additional seats to purchase invoices and verified their existence and approved the addition of the $950,000 of inventory. Hmm. That doesn't sound right to me. Okay. So it says auditors trace the items on the additional seats. So we see the word trace there. Okay. Is this actually what they're doing? Are they tracing? Sure. Sounds like it. It's like they're going from the floor to the sheets, which means that they're testing completeness, not existence. Dun, dun, dun. All right. 
They did not properly notify management about the added sheets. In addition, Kumar altered other count sheets before sending them to the auditors by changing unit designations. For example, six motor mounts became six motors. Raising counts added fictitious line items to the compared count sheets. These other fictitious changes added an three, additional $375,000 to the inflated inventory. None of them was detected by the auditors. All right. So this should be depressing to everybody because this is something that... What's that? Well, you know, they were young and they were naive and they're were, they were, they were impressionable. And J.P. Kumar is a silver, silver tongue devil. Okay. Silver tongue devil. What audit procedures did the auditor apparently not follow that should have detected Kumar's fraudulently, fraudulent increase of inventory? Now, we've talked about all of these to some degree. Some of them are a little bit more apparent and specific to the situation. So you're an auditor here. What are some red flags? What are some things you should have done that this audit team did not do? Some of it's really easy. Get an actual inventory count. Yeah, do an actual inventory count. So they said, the racks are so high, I have to climb a ladder to get up there. And I'm really afraid of heights. And Can we just have the client do this? The answer is no. Okay, the answer is no. My inventory counts that I had to do was in the middle of Oklahoma in winter, walking up the stairs of 200 foot pylons of chemical storage containers. Okay, while the wind is blowing in Oklahoma. Do you know how much wind there is in Oklahoma? A lot of it, a lot of it. And it was cold, cold and biting. And I had to climb it to the top. And if I have to do that, you guys have to climb to this cop storage racks, okay? I'm telling you right now. So that's an easy one. What else? Back in my day. That wasn't actually that long ago. It's like, yeah, chemical storage containers from the 1800s. Yes. What else? What else should what else should have been done here? Yeah, I probably should have been doing a little bit more test of controls in this area, saying, hey. We probably need to be a little bit more rigorous in our substantive procedures because they've scrapped controls to save costs and we're not happy here. What about the uh, count sheets? Was everything okay with the count sheets? There were a couple of things wrong with it. So uh, two count sheets got added during the audit. What do we know about auditor's responsibility for the count sheets? No count sheet should be added during the count. No additional information should be added. If it is, you got to basically start all over again. So there was a problem there. But... That wasn't the only problem. So J.P. Kumar said, oh, by the way, four more count sheets that we didn't have during the inventory, but I promise you it's totally legit. At this point, should you trust anything that J.P. Kumar says? You've already got all these red flags. You're just kind of like, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. Let me let me trace this because my book said tracing is a test of existence, okay? And I believe everything the book says, all right? So we didn't actually test the existence of the additional inventory. So some, certainly some problems here. And uh, yeah, so... That certainly uh, certainly some concerns. Let's talk more about some implications. What was uh, what were the implications of the auditor failure to detect material fraud as described here? So, just logically speaking, would the auditors be held liable in this situation? Oh, 100 percent, absolutely. So keep in mind that we as we have responsibility to direct to detect material fraud or detect fraud that has a direct and material effect on the financial statements. That is kind of the auditor's responsibility as specified by the SEC and the PCAOB. Now, what does that mean? It means that we have to prepare our procedures. We have to actually develop procedures that are capable of detecting fraud of this nature. Does it seem like that these procedures were capable of doing that the way that they are currently tailored? I don't believe so. I don't believe that we make some arguments that there were some, certainly some problems. If this is a low assurance test, if this is a private company, we need low assurance. Maybe we can make an argument here, but this is not the case. There was a lot of assurance needed, and the assurance need grew over the course of the audit because of the red flags that kept popping up. So there should have been more work, not less done on the part of the auditor. All right. According to the audit standards listing at the start of this chapter, what responsibility do auditors have to discuss their concerns with the entity's audit committee? Now, this is um, – did I have you guys answer that question, or did I specify? Well, we'll talk about it anyway. Okay. So if you're the auditor here and you run into these issues – you run into all these red flags. Does this need to be communicated to the audit committee? Okay, it, says, it said that they didn't actually tell anybody about manage, in management about this. So first of all, we know that management should have been notified saying, okay, we're running into some concerns. We think that we're going to have to do some additional testing in this area because we can't rely on whatever is being represented by this particular, this particular group. Again, keep in mind, this is a subsidiary or a small a, a unit location of this company. So it doesn't represent the entire company as a whole, but there's some substantial problems here. So the management should have been notified. This should have also definitely been uh, specified 
respect or is communicated to the audit committee. Audit committee should be noted, notified saying, look, your performance-based compensation measures, uh, the procedures you have in place, the ability for managers to uh, modify controls at the unit level, these are all problems that are going to lead to misstatements in this area and possibly fraud as we're seeing in this particular situation. Now, the interesting question that's not related to this, and this is what I'm going to kind of leave you with, because I said we we're going to leave out early. So I'm going to give you guys at least 10 minutes. OK, but do, do we think that things like this happen in the real in the real world world? We actually note that they, they do. I and mean, we've seen prior examples of this. Obviously, uh, I think everybody was uh, at uh, see this is AIS. So so uh, our presenter yesterday, uh, Nishant Bajaria, Bajaria, I'm working on the name, Nishant Bajaria. He actually presented to my AS class and he brought up the name of a company that was fairly well known called Enron. Okay. So corporate cultures can actually lead to this kind of issue. And a lot of it had to do with what we talked about at the beginning about the incentive based compensation, about being paid for performance. And in this particular situation, because of the new competitor, what, did, by the way, we didn't talk about the new competitor. What does that represent with respect to audit, with respect to the audit environment? An inherent risk, okay? A new risk in that area that we hadn't considered before. Can inherent risk affect how we actually approach things? Yes, because that's going to, even if we say inherent risk was high before, it may actually drive it even higher. So that's going to increase our risk of material misstatement. So a concern in that area as well. And we already know that there's an incentive to try to do something wrong because this new competitor makes it much, much harder to achieve certain performance results. So a lot of things that are kind of categorized in these questions, and I love questions like this because they don't just cover one particular area, but cover an amalgamation of things that we discussed in this course. So as you're preparing for the exam, don't forget to come back and review some of the information here because it's just a good topic uh, area to review. All right, uh, we are done for today. Our last week of lectures next week. So I will see you guys then.